Well, hello everybody. Welcome to the webinar, Global Business Opportunities for Architectural Solar, BIPV. Um, the webinar is organized by Solar Plaza together with um, ASA, the Architectural Solar Association from the US. Um, my name is Edwin Cote and uh, I will be your chairman for today. Um, let me see if I can get to the next slide. Yes, that's me. Um, I started in solar in 1994 as a solar consultant and in 2004 I founded two, uh, the company Solar Plaza. Um, we, I have organized and chaired dozens of solar trade missions and high level conferences around the world. So a little about uh, Solar Plaza. Yep, that's going quickly, a little bit too fast. Um, yeah, so our mission of the company Solar Plaza is to positively impact the world by accelerating the sustainable energy transition. The company founded in 2004, we have organized more than 85 events across the globe from Chile to China to Japan, from South Africa to the northern parts of Europe. Um, more than 25 countries, we have a network of more than 50,000 people in the solar industry um, worldwide. We organize events. Uh, we have some uh, professional business to business level, uh, high level conference and trade missions coming up. Uh, next week already our trade mission to Indonesia just uh, kicks off. We have our biggest conference in uh, San Francisco, end of March, solar asset management events coming up in Argentina, Nigeria, as well as in our country, the Netherlands. And that's where my company is based here in Rotterdam. Uh, so once again, welcome to all of you across the globe. Our agenda, um, after my short introduction, we'll have two brief introductions by ASA, the Architectural Solar Association, and two expert presentations, one from the Europe and one from the US, on business cases in, with BIPV. We have Q&A session after the two presentations, but um, you can send in questions during the presentation as well, and we will try to um, uh, answer that with the speakers um, after their short presentation of around 10 minutes. So, um, yeah, let me go back to my, in my history, when I started in solar in 1994, in 1996, I was able to, uh, yeah, develop together with an energy utility, a first project, a, a PV facade. And at that time in 1996, the cost, the additional cost, which will be a topic of discussion during our webinar, what is additional cost? But the additional cost of this PV facade was 750 euros per square meter just to give you some perspective of what happened in, in the market. And you know, probably this curve um, from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, that the cost of solar have uh, decreased by more, more than 100 times since 1977. And even in the last um, eight years, 80% uh, reduction has been achieved. So a tremendous uh, advancement of, of solar, and that opens up new opportunities for BIPV. Although the focus in the market so far has been on the larger scale projects, the ground-based projects, the residential and CNI. So, what's going to happen with um, um, with the BIPV market? What does the business case look like today? Um, that's what we're going to discuss. And the question, of course, is: Is it all about the money, or is there more at stake in these projects? So, what are the business opportunities for architectural solar solutions? Um, as solar is becoming the cheapest energy source. Yeah, can architectural solar solutions lead to energy neutral buildings at an attractive financial return? And uh, will they become the backbone of zero, zero energy buildings? And what are the hottest markets of architectural solar solutions? And what are the most attractive market segments in uh, Europe and US or globally? So is it roofs, is it facades or other, other structures? So we're gonna discuss these business cases and uh, we'll just discuss this uh, kind of questions during today's webinar. Um, maybe some practical notes for you uh, as attendee. You can send in your questions during, uh, at, in the menu on the right side of your screen. Uh, there is a box called questions. You can type your questions and they will be received by my colleagues and we will gather them. And after each presentation, we'll give the floor. We will uh, dis discuss some of the, your, your questions. I, I can promise that all of the questions will be uh, we will, um, we will um, answer and, and, and deal with because that's impossible. Um, we have done ex uh, webinars before and hundreds of questions came in. So that's impossible to do with all of them, but don't hesitate to send them in. If you encounter any technical issues, feel free to use the chat box. It's also on your menu. And then my colleague might, might be able to help you 
and uh, so that you can hear and see all the screens. Just for the record, and good to know that all the presentation slides will be made available after the webinar. This webinar will be recorded as well, and so it can be downloaded and, and uh, hear back again from our website. We will announce that later on. Good. So far, practical notes for our program. We'll kick off with a presentation, brief introduction by Browning Rockwell, the executive director of uh, the ASA. Uh, followed by Chris Klinga. He will uh, discuss the global BRPV opportunities. He is the technical director of ASA. And then followed by the European business case by Renato Marconi. He's the principal of Energy Glass. And finally, but not last, um, it's Anthony Pereira, who will discuss the US perspective and business case. Uh, he is an owner of Alt Power. And after uh, all the presentations, we'll, uh, we'll end with a five to 10 minutes uh, Q&A session again. So please hang in there. The whole webinar will uh, take about an hour, and we'll hope we'll have an entertaining and uh, good discussion. Well, first of all, um, I will give the floor to Browning Rockwell. He is director and the co-founder of um, the Architectural Solar Association. Um, he has a very long history in solar. Um, I met him many years ago and when we did uh, trade missions and events together in Saudi Arabia, uh, where he founded the Solar Industry Association in Saudi Arabia. Um, he has tremendous uh, background and uh, experience with uh, project and technical management, international background, and he will uh, briefly introduce the Architectural Solar Association, followed by Chris Klingler, who will go deeper into the um, global market for BIPV. Let me switch the screens and see if I can manage that. Okay, here we are. Uh, we'll start again. Apologize for the little technical issue here. Um, Again, this is uh, speaking on behalf of the Architectural Solar Association. I am one of the co-founders of this, along with Chris Klinga and a number of other members of our advisory board. Uh, we founded it in March of last year, uh, basically had been uh, in somewhat of a stealth mode for a while. And I began speaking with Edwin uh, some time ago about uh, putting together this webinar. And as he indicated, we've done this in the past and been quite successful with it. Uh, he's a great partner and brings in that global audience because it, while the ASA was founded at, in uh, Boulder, Colorado, it is certainly a global organization and meant to be global. And we're encouraging people to get involved globally because this is an issue that is not only just unique to the United States, it's an issue out of Europe, Asia, Middle East, and so forth. So I hope our audience today is uh, it comes from all, all parts of the world. Um, I can't move my screen, Edward, if you can move it down one. So real quick, the Architecture Association is an industry advocate, like many associations. I won't go into all the details, but we represent a growing industry with a common goal of transforming building facades and other architectural services into generating assets. Um, just looking back real quick, Edwin referenced 1975. I read the other day that the cost of a solar cell today is 1% of what it was in 1975. Yet, if you look at BIPV, BIPV has been discussed probably since 1975 or before, and yet it's still an industry that's in its infancy in many ways. And some of those issues that we're addressing are standards development, uh, demand creation, and building industry adoption. Um, we hope that, it, hope that as a result of this uh, webinar, you will see that this is a topic of great interest and want to get involved and reach out to us and see how you can participate, because this is very much of a uh, an industry that needs to you know, incorporate lots of different parts and pieces to make it work. But with that, I'll pass it over to Chris Klinga, uh, my associate and co-founder of ASA. And Chris is going to talk to you a little about some of the more technical aspects and financial aspects of the uh, ASA and BIPV. Okay, Browning, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, um, we lost the connection with Chris. Can you follow up with the, the next slides while we try to make yeah, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Sure, 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 go ahead and move, you can move the slides. Okay, Chris is gonna get into, uh, give us a definition of BIPV, which I think is something that has been uh, perplexing to many people. Uh, if you look up on Wikipedia or anywhere, there's many different definitions. You have BIPV, BAPV, um, the market size and opportunity we'll, we'll get into a little bit, uh, looking at where it is and where it, we hope it's going, uh, looking at incremental costs of BIPV. This is uh, one, of the, one of the driving factors right now, I think, of looking at the cost structure of BIPV, because I think it's, it's been a bit of a mystery and it's been kind of a bespoke industry. It's kind of emerging out of that and each project has its own sort of cost basis, but there are some 
some uh, common denominators there and pricing issues we can look at and hopefully dispel some of the mythology around BIPD and hopefully open up the market for more discussion and more awareness. Um, Chris is also going to get into, I think, an issue he brought up, and I was I, I really support this. Um, looking at BIPV and trying to give our own definition of it, you know, PV with architectural significance. I think that's a really a key element, PV with architectural significance. And that's why we looked at naming this organization Architectural Solar Association. It wasn't the BIPV organization, it's the Ar Architectural Solar Association because this, you know, this is going to take form in a lot of different ways, and with, as he states, BIPV with architectural significance, I think, sort of encapsulates it very well. And so, as the definition states, BIPV shall be defined as a photovoltaic generating component which forms an integral and essential part of a permanent building structure, without which a non-BIPV building material component would be required to replace it. Performance of power generation by a BIPV component is deemed to be secondary to the role of being a building material or structural component. So BIPV occupies a space in the building design such that if removed from that space, its absence would be distinct and noticeable. That may be very wordy, but I think if you break it down and look, study it a little bit, and hopefully you'll look at that, um, and we welcome any comments to that effect, uh, give us your input, but I think it does encapsulate where we are with BIPV today. So is is Chris back on now? No, no, Jeff. Browning, I'm, 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 Browning, I'm here via audio. Um, okay, well, go ahead. And uh, I'd like. I'm sorry that I have well, not there on the webinar. Uh, some, my internet went down. Um, but okay. yeah, I'll, I'll take it from here. And Browning, if you can control the slides for me, that'd be great. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, the as far as the market size and opportunity. Um, the BIPV market uh, is an interesting topic. Uh, it, it's a point that has seen a range of numbers over the years. Unfortunately, to this day, it is difficult to substantiate these numbers due to the fragmented nature of the market. Here are a few of those numbers as a reference. As one can see, they are all over the place. At the, architect, at the Architectural Solar Association, uh, at, at the Architectural Solar Association, uh, we look at we we look to clearly define the global market and identify clear metrics that industry can use to assess the opportunity. We believe that once some of the major barriers in front of the IPV are broken down and the IPV is clearly defined, we will be able to accurately assess the global opportunity. Go on to the next slide, Brian. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. The benefits of BIPV are what makes it interesting. BIPV is multifunctional by nature. By being integrated into the design of a building, it gracefully raises one's awareness of sustainability efforts. It maximizes distributed energy generation potential, and it can optimize daylighting and reduce buildings' cooling loads. By serving multiple, build, multiple functions, the energy, energy generating features have a lower embodied energy. Lastly, financially speaking, manufacturing and installation costs can be analyzed on an incremental basis. Let's move on to take a look at exactly how that works. Next slide. This is it. You're... The incremental cost of the IPV uh, is one of, the, one of the main reasons the topic of architectural solar or the IPV is so interesting today. It's, it's due to the reductions in costs and materials and how it plays into the incremental costs of the IPV itself. This graph here is based on the recent NRL Q1 2016 benchmark costing analysis as well as current module pricing. It shows how residential and commercial PV have come down in price from $90 a square foot and $65 per square foot respectively to $41 and $29 per square per square foot, respectively. For those of you interested in converting these numbers to euro per square meter, you can conveniently just add a zero. This will be a, a quick conversion that could be helpful throughout this webinar. Please note that these are figures used on, these are figures based on traditional TV systems within the US. Next slide. PIPV baseline installation costs. When analyzing architectural solar, 
or VIP installations, we like to take a bottom-up approach, as does NREL with the recent TV cost benchmarking studies. First and foremost, the baseline installation costs of PV should be thoroughly understood. By baseline installation costs, I mean the installation costs after removing any of the components that add value to the structure. For example, the module, the structural BLS cost, and in some cases, the installation labor. In addition, you have to remove all their corresponding markups. By removing these figures, we can analyze a baseline cost that is near identical to traditional PV installations. Luckily, luckily we have the recent NRL studies to do just that. Here are the figures for commercial and residential, fig residential uh, installations that we see as the most applicable to the architectural solar market. They translate to a $1.12 to $1.28 per watt commercially and a $1.89 to $2.09 per watt residentially. These figures are in U.S. dollars. To the, next slide. To determine the total incremental cost, we add the incremental VITV module and structural BLS cost along with their corresponding markups to the figures that we saw before. We also add an additional labor, any additional labor that may be intrinsic to the nature of the PV installation, if applicable. This is, rare, this is rarely the case, though. Lastly, if the module incremental cost failed to capture the value of a material that we, was being replaced, such as a roof system in a carport, we would subtract it and then come to the total incremental cost. Next slide, please. Here you will find the assumptions we are using to determine the baseline incremental cost. Rather than review them in detail, I will just provide them as a reference. A link to the paper reference can be found at the bottom of the slide. Next slide. In synopsis, based on the NRL data and some general market information, here are the baseline installation cost ranges as well as the VITV specific material plus installer margin. One number that may be jumping out at you is the $4.50 per watt upper end of the VITV material incremental cost. I see this number as an upper limit for VITV technologies. One needs to understand that there are several cost factors that go into VITV products. The, the more architecturally integrated they are, the more they cost. Several cost factors that come into play are level of building integration, visual constraints such as racking color, cell color sorting, glass distortion, glass color slash thickness, and overall glass size, thickness, and degree of customization all play major roles in cost, among other items also listed here. When you add the baseline installation cost to the BIPV material incremental cost, you arrive at the total incremental cost. Next slide. Generally speaking, from a commercial to residential perspective, the total incremental cost of architectural solar can realistically range from $1.74 to $6.59 per watt, or $25 to $96 per square foot, or $257 to €970 Euro per square meter. Installation type has a large impact on this range. And to provide further clarity, I've provided my best guess on what I believe to be an average cost base number on these two installation extremes. Carports and sunshades being installed with glass, glass commodity PV laminates with architectural racking while being the low end, while a fully integrated wall system featuring PV IGUs being the upper end. It should be noted that these are ballpark figures based on limited in industry information. Due to the countless architectural details that dictate the final cost, these values should be taken with a grain of salt. Next slide. The previous numbers lead me to a very relevant figure. In the U.S., the approximate cost of an insulated curtain wall typically ranges from $80 to $120 per square foot. Some are more expensive, some are less. But this range provides a good middle-of-the-road target for an interesting analysis of the U.S. investment tax credit. A unique attribute to BIPD product project is that the ITC is potentially applicable to building components that typically wouldn't otherwise be eligible. This is a topic that has seen some precedence through the carport market 
but is awaiting a firm private ruling letters from the IRS. Assuming this theory holds, some DITV pro project could potentially be seen as zero cost to the end user after the ITC. Based on the numbers above, this parity threshold would be an in installed incremental cost of $34 to $51 per square foot, or $2.38 to $3.50 per watt. These values would bring a typical curtain wall to 114, from $114 to $171 per square foot before the tax credit, and back down to $80 to $120 per square foot after the tax credit. For the previous example, a PDIGU that encloses the envelope could see an installation cost of $4.77 per watt or $0.69 cents per square foot. On a $120 per square foot curtain wall, this would lead to a post-ITC incremental cost of only $1.27 per watt or $12.30 per square foot, which yields an extremely attractive payback. Next slide. As you can see, DITV is very attractive in the U.S. market due to the ITC. In addition, lead building standards in the California Title 24 building code are also large market drivers. Tesla's plan to bring to market its solar roof shingle has potential to course correct the residential DITV market. In the EU, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive requires all new buildings to be nearly zero energy by the end of 2020. The EU also has several countries with DITV specific incentives. Lastly, globally, the key drivers will be the recent significant cost reductions within the PV supply chain, the fact that large building industry veterans such as Pilkington, AGC, and CertainTeed are starting to fully adopt DITV technologies into their product line. This is a critical step towards DITV gaining widespread adoption. Next slide. At this point, I would like to thank you all for your time and move the discussions to some actual business cases within the EU via our panelist Renato Maconi with Energy Glass. Thank you. All right, Chris and Browning, thank you very much for this very informative presentation. Um, there is a lot of information, and I'm, I think uh, we will be glad that we can share this presentation after the webinar at some point to all attendees. Um, I think there are some uh, really uh, good numbers in there. I was just wondering, I, I don't know if you can say something about it. This, so the Architectural Solar Association, uh, Brown and Chris, is, is, is focused on the U.S. or is it a global association? No, uh, as I say, it's, it's a global organization. Uh, we have one of, the, one of the reasons it came together is we had some interested parties from both Europe and the United States come together. We were talking about the VIPV market in the United States, and it became very clear that um, there was never, there wasn't a good way, there wasn't very good information or a lot of, a lot of issues that needed to be resolved. So we sat around a table and basically said that this, this is something that we need to bring together a global audience, global participants. Um, and that's the case. The advisory board is made up of players from uh, Europe, the United States, Middle East, uh, and Asia. Uh, we very much want to make this a global initiative and we welcome uh, people to get involved. Okay. Well, and, and so I don't know if you can answer this question, but where do you see the, of course, in the U.S. you have the IDC, which is a huge uh, trigger to, to build this kind of projects. But uh, is the U.S., if you look at it from a global perspective, is the U.S. the most attractive BIPV market, to your opinion? Uh, I mean, I'd say it's probably the most immature in many cases, but it's probably the largest potential market. Um, uh, and it, you know, it has an opportunity also to be grown with, you know, for manufacturing to occur in the United States because this is an industry I think that's right for local production. Um, I, and I think that the U European market is, is somewhat ahead of the U.S. market right now, both technically in terms of installs. But you know, I, I think it can be a, 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 the U.S. can be a driver for global market development as well. I see. Uh, got interest out of out of the Middle East, particularly in Dubai, that's very interested in this. Uh, I think in the Asian markets where there's sort of iconic architecture that's being developed there and they want to integrate the latest building techniques, uh, there, there's interest there. I think it's just more exposure and bringing it out and defining it a little bit better because it's kind of been lost inside the, the solar market to date. And it's, you know, we've been, the headlines have been around utility scale and commercial and industrial. Uh, this is, a, this is a, piece that has not gotten its its play in the in the in the press yet because it's not well understood and hopefully we can make that better understood and let 
real okay. estate developers and construction companies uh, start integrating this. Okay, thanks, Browning. So, Chris, are you still there? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 I can hear you perfectly well. Um, in your presentation, there was a question coming in uh, referring to your 15.6% uh, efficiency uh, assumed in your presentation, and someone ask, asking whether that is a rather outdated uh, number. Isn't it higher currently? I don't know if you can answer that question. Yeah, yeah I, I would say that um, the 15.6% efficiency is really, it was pinned there because all of the NRL studies um, on the 2016 data uh, based on, or sorry, the 2015 data out of California was based on that uh, being the average. But um, I would definitely say that the efficiency has gone up. But something to keep in mind is that in architectural solar, you regularly see uh, high cell efficiencies but low conversion efficiencies because white glass needs to be thicker and there's maybe coatings on the, the glass. So I, I don't doubt that 15.6 is a good number to use uh, from an architectural perspective because it's, sometimes it's harder to get the higher conversion efficiencies with architectural products. Okay. Um, another question which popped up uh, from my mind is you, you talked about really attractive payback times uh, using the ITC in some of the BRPV uh, market segments. So can you, can you point out which market segments or which application, would, which BIPV solution would be, would you point out as the most attractive right now if you can apply the ITC? Um, yeah, can you say something about that? Can it, can well, it even so be more attractive than, than a roof application? A simple roof application? Uh, no, I mean, you've got to keep in mind here, we're talking about uh, comparing building technologies. So, for instance, if, uh, if someone's going to put a carport in their, uh, in their parking lot because they have the opportunity to put solar on it, then it's not as attractive, right? But they still would get the ITC on the complete structure. So, but when we're looking at it from an incremental cost perspective, and when it, the ITC starts being very attractive is when we have a building component that we're replacing. And yeah. so in the, in the case of a curtain wall, that is a, there's a big barrier to entry there, as far as the US market specifically. So the costs are high, um, but you know, a low hanging fruit, I would say, in the BIPD market would be replacing uh, sunshades, uh, maybe metal sunshades with PV laminates. Uh, yeah. And there, that, that would be the low hanging fruit, because you could utilize a standard commodity PV laminate at a low cost, but replace a standard building component. Okay, thanks Chris. Maybe a last question before we go to the next presentation uh, coming from Dubai. Someone um, says um, whether you are aware of the recent fires in the facades near the Burj Khalifa um, as part of the new fire code that has been released, um, which might be much more a challenge for realizing BP, BIPV in the United Arab Emirates. So can you take, yeah, can you say anything about that, Browning? Um, um, I, I am aware of the fires and the subsequent change in fire codes, but I, I don't know, I, mean, I think it has to be studied, but I don't think that was necessarily related to, I think it was more the insulation materials and how that was meeting up with the electrical components there. Uh, certainly this is an issue that's not just in Dubai, but elsewhere that, that needs to be embraced and addressed, and that's why one of the things we, in terms of our standards and policy, we hope we want to have outreach on these issues to discuss them and look at what's what's necessary. But I, I don't see it as a, a barrier. I think it's something that just has to be brought out and discussed. Um, you know, Dubai has made has, this became a big issue because of these these fires and these high rise buildings. But it was not an issue of of BIPV being part of that. But I think we, it's something that has to be addressed and will certainly be addressed. And we'd welcome a, a dialogue on that. All right, thanks, Brian. So before we go to the next speaker, I would like to do uh, post a, a poll question to all our attendees. So um, let me see if I can make that work um, and present you a poll question on the screen. Can you see the question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So please, um, if uh, you all can answer this, uh, this poll question, what do you see as the largest uh, barrier for the BIPV market development? Um, what do you think that is uh, financial um, due to a lack of incentives, or you think that the, um, the lack of BIPV specific codes and standards is um, a threshold for BIPV market development? Maybe the building degree integration or to involve the building industry in this new market? 
lack of knowledge and experience in the building sector could also be a reason, or maybe you have another opinion on what you think is the main reason or the main barrier for the large for uh, BIPV market development. Yes. Okay. Thank you for your cooperation. So we'll now show you the results of this uh, poll, um, which is interesting that. Um, you all uh, acknowledge the lack of knowledge and, and experience in the building sector as one of the most important issues that has to be solved. Um, and that's also, I think, related to the building industry um, uh, integration. Uh, this is a nice bridge to um, our next speakers because they are coming from the building industry and they're having a business in the BIPV sector. So they are aware and they're encountering these kind of issues every day. So let me go to the next uh, speaker. Um, all right. Yeah. And then wait a second that I make Renato Marconi. He is the next uh, speaker. I'll give him the keyboard and the mouse so that he can control the screen. And hopefully that will solve also our technical issues. Um, Renato, can you hear me? Yes. OK, I'll give you the floor and uh, take it away with your presentation on the building integrated photovoltaics. Thank you very much uh, and good morning and good afternoon uh, to the attendees and my name is uh, Renato Macconi. I come from Italy and uh, I'm the founder and the CEO of Energy Blast that is a company uh, specialized in design and uh, um, production of uh, uh, BIPV components. Uh, I would like to go to the second slide. Can you check? You can click if you uh, want to. Yeah, I click it. I click it. Okay, that didn't work. Okay, let me let me do it from here. Oh, thank you. Uh, Energy Glass established uh, in uh, 2007, and uh, as I said, they specialized in design and production of architectural elements that produce energy, so BIPD. Uh, we realized that during our uh, activities about uh, 350 BIPD projects worldwide, but mainly in uh, in Europe. We are talking today about one. Uh, Previous, previous slide, please. Okay, uh, talking today about uh, one typical solution uh, of BIPV that is uh, photovoltaic glass for architecture, that is composed of a uh, normal glass for architecture, so a front glass. Uh, when you apply BIPV, we choose a low iron glass. Then two foil of PVB, that is the normal material used in glass for architecture with photovoltaic cells inside in between the two foils. And then a back glass that could be a float glass or another low iron glass, like in the business case that we will see after. And if we are talking about an EGU glass, also a spacer and uh, final back glass. So this is a typical construction elements for facade uh, mainly. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, in order to design and realize a proper BIPV solution, it is necessary to have uh, three main uh, competencies that normally are separated on the market. That is uh, uh, the design and aesthetic uh, competencies, photovoltaic for solar cell and all the electrical stuff regarding a BIPV solution and also um, uh, knowledge of the construction elements, in this case, laminated glass for architecture. Um, a BIPV project starts from design because uh, we have to uh, give an answer to the uh, requirements of applying photovoltaic to a building, a building that can have a particular shape uh, that uh, uh, is, uh, um, is constructed with some um, element that could be glass, but also other kind of, uh, of elements. So we need to start from uh, uh, the other slide, please. Okay, uh, we need to start uh, with an analysis of technical and construction aspect of the um, of the buildings, uh, in order to to see how kind of solution uh, we can uh, we can apply. So, so we have also to analyze to make an analysis of the exposure and the shading, uh, the type of uh, construction elements. So the composition of the glass 
of a facade, for example. And then we have to find the most sweet, suitable uh, wiring system in order to um, connect the photovoltaic glasses uh, each other to compose a string and uh, to um, bring the electrical uh, energy to the inverters and, and so on. And uh, uh, another issue that is uh, uh, important at the same level is the electrical system design that is quite similar to an electrical system of a standard or uh, uh, field photovoltaic system. But in case of building, we have to respect also some uh, uh, fire code, for, for example, requirements. Uh, and, and so there is uh, some typical solution developed for BIPV in order to satisfy those requirements. The application of BIPV is possible in uh, I, I can say all the uh, building surface that are that are well exposed. So um, at the south, uh, east, uh, west, and it could be in facade, in shading system, or in uh, in roof system, like you can see in these uh, in these images. Um, the selection of uh, the best photovoltaic technology uh, in terms of si uh, silicon solar cell or thin film is very important when uh, uh, we are designing IBIPV solution. Um, some of them are aesthetic in terms of color, could be color or, or cell disposition as we see uh, after, but it's important that depending on the um, requirements of the building, we find we have to find the appropriate technology in order to have the right balance between the three main variables that describe the IPV solution, that is price, performance and design and aesthetic. For example, it's possible to uh, dispose the cells, the solar cells in a, in a glass in many ways, not only the classical matrix representation, but also, as you can see, in other uh, layout and configuration in order to meet some design requirements. Uh, it's important to uh, also to design the cabling system of a BIPV component in order to be compatible with uh, uh, all the frame or malleum system that is normally used in uh, architecture, uh, facade or covering in order to adapt uh, to this system and avoid to modify those systems for the IPV installation. Uh, it's also um, possible with the IPV because the IPV is a custom photovoltaic solution. So it's possible to realize uh, uh, also shaped glasses or uh, big glasses also in terms of, uh, of size and vary also the density of cell in different uh, part of the building, uh, depending also respect to the daylighting function, for example, an application uh, have to respect. A in very interesting technology uh, that can uh, increase the advantages of a BIPV solution is the bifacial solar cell. I'm going to show you two uh, projects that we realized in Italy using this technology with uh, uh, very interesting advantages in terms of energy produced. Uh, very often in the glass architecture, there is good environment uh, and diffuse light that can be used and converted uh, in energy like uh, the direct light. Uh, BIPV with bifacial solar cell is a way to maximize the energy production and also to give uh, to the application of some aesthetic uh, value because the cell looks uh, the same way in the in the in both uh, in both sides uh, and so uh, also in the back side are blue like or, or black like in the front side. Uh, we um, measured with a, a laboratory uh, the um, energy production comparing a, a standard uh, monocrystalline solar cell with a, um, a bifacial monocrystalline solar cell with the same number of cells, the same glass, same situation. And here you can see the energy that you produce uh, with the bifacial solar cell is, is greater and until 20, 30% in some cases respect to the standard technology. And this way 
you can have advantages in terms of uh, uh, economical value of the VIPV installation. Here we see the first uh, business case is a facade in a new block in, in Milan uh, where uh, there are about five buildings with uh, uh, VIPV installation and this one is a, is a new building, is, a, is not a new building, it's a renovation of, a, of an old building where the customer decided to uh, make a new facade of that building integrating the BIPV. Okay, in this case the BIPV is integrated as you can see in, in uh, uh, some windows but not uh, to the vision but uh, under and uh, over the, the over part of each windows and also in the balcony uh, at the top of, of the buildings. Uh, here we installed 185 kilowatt. Note that this is a vertical west and east exposition, so maybe quite the worst case of uh, um, solar, uh, let's say, installation. But uh, we can show that using um, bifacial solar cell, the results uh, is uh, is good, even if the situation, the application is not. Uh, south, well south exposed. Uh, we have uh, 135 uh, um, square meter of balcony with 80% of cell density, uh, 1,230 uh, EGU PV uh, glass and uh, uh, another 235 PV transparent uh, um, glass. The uh, PV EGU with white back glass is used to increment the energy pro produced by the bifacial solar cell. Uh, the energy measured and produced by this, uh, this building is about 100 megawatt per year. Let's move to see some figures, some numbers regarding this, this project. The total additional cost of this BIPV, this typical application, is about uh, $300 per square meter and includes solar cell, cabling, cabling and balance of system components. The application is about 1,600 square meter and the average efficiency due to the uh, transparency of the glass is uh, 11.5, so 115 peak watt per square meter. The total energy yields by, by square, per square meter of this uh, project is 68 kilowatt hour per year. That means $20 per square meter a year. And in this case, in the, this worst case, let's say of application of the IPV, the payback period is, uh, period is about 15 years. Let's see another project. Here we are, we, we are in a um, uh, better condition in terms of uh, uh, solar exposition and so we can say that we are in an ideal bifacial solar cell application. The, um, uh, we have a clear back environment so a lot of uh, uh, diffuse light that can uh, reach 20% of back irradiation respect to the front irradiation. So the um, project uh, uh, is about 400 kilowatt installed and the energy produced reach 400 and 50 megawatt per, per year. Let's see the number. So we can uh, compare this application with the previous one. In this case, uh, the cell density is higher, and so the uh, peak watt per square meter is 180, so quite 18% of efficiency, considering the bifacial effect. The extra cost or additional cost is $350 per square meter. In this case, the total energy produced per square meter is 200 kilowatt. That means $55 per square meter a year, and in this case, the payback drop at 6.5 years. So we can say that at the moment, BIPV is a solution that really gives an answer to the necessity of uh, producing renewable energy uh, for, for the buildings. This is our experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Renato, for a very informative uh, presentation with interesting business cases. Um, uh, definitely the last uh, project uh, showed very attractive uh, financial numbers. Um, I was just wondering for a brief uh, IGU, where, what does it stand for? 
is an insulating glass window. Ah, okay, good. That's good to be. Uh, so is the yeah is a is a laminated glass with a spacer with argon or iron in the middle and a back glass is a typical um, structure used for for facade. Yeah. Um, so so you the projects that you have done and your um, built Renato are they all in Europe? Or did you also uh, have mainly, any projects in Latin America, for instance? Mainly, no. We realized the one one project in the US, but mainly in uh, Europe, uh, North uh, North Africa, uh, and uh, the, yes, ninety five percent of our um, project uh, is realized in Europe. Yeah, in your business cases, and that's another question that came in. It seems like uh, when you're calculating the economic value that uh, you calculate with about thirty dollar cents per kilowatt hour which seems relatively high um, but can you explain no, is, is it 30 is it three hundred dollars for um, a square meter yeah but also the, uh, the, 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 the the revenues from the energy uh, seem to be high but Probably that is also related to the high uh, electricity costs in Italy. Is that the Italy, case? We, we, the cost could reach uh, zero, zero three, zero twenty five. The overall cost of uh, of, uh, of energy. So yeah, euro cents uh, per kilowatt hour. Yeah. Even no, no, in the CNI, zero zero two from zero two to zero three uh, yeah. euro per kilowatt hour. Yes. Yeah, and that is also in the CNI segment for for commercial uh, company. Commercial, company, yeah. Yeah. commercial, not industry. Industry is, is, is lower. Yeah, okay. Um, what, what, what do you see as the, the most interesting markets for, as you look at your own company, which, which markets are most interesting for BIPV in Europe? Is it uh, Italy uh, or? No, it's a market, no, Europe, uh, absolutely, North Africa, but the main issue for, in my opinion, for BIPV uh, diffusion uh, is the uh, certification and the regulation uh, uh, law because, for example, uh, in, in Europe we have a certification process that allow a family product certification because each BIPV application can be realized with different glass size, a different number of cells and something like that. So uh, one of the main issues is the uh, certification process the, the for example UL certification US is a little bit uh, um, is, is difficult to certify different size different kind of of product yeah and even in Europe is it unified or is it uh, does it vary per country no we we have a, a we have we have some uh, special certification but uh, uh, they doesn't affect the BIPV application we use the e EEC uh, certification process in Europe. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and if you look at the various applications, you discussed this structure and uh, the, the the facade um, solution. Uh, what market segment, to your opinion, in Europe is is most attractive? Uh, is it the, um, the 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 structure you just showed in your previous slide, um, that, like in the people movers business case? Is it this kind of structure that is uh, the the most interesting one? But keep present that the BIPV is uh, uh, an application that you uh, take uh, in consideration when in a building you can't apply a cheaper solution. So uh, in our opinion, uh, it's not uh, a matter of uh, uh, choosing BIPV or, or not. If it's not possible to apply a standard solution that costs less and the aesthetic of the buildings require a beautiful solution you have to to move to BIPV and yeah. uh, you use the same system that you use for uh, glass architecture there yeah. is no um, changes in uh, in all the system that you use yeah. and if you uh, look at the experiences you have in your projects uh, were most of these projects new buildings so by new designs by architects and maybe aiming for a zero energy building uh, or are most of your projects renovation projects? Both, both because uh, in new buildings you have maybe more flexibility in terms of choosing the right or the, or the better PIPV solution. In renovation we have to adapt uh, to the building uh, shape and, uh, and uh, other, other aspects. But uh, we are, in our experience, uh, in the past the new buildings uh, was the main market. But uh, right now 
the uh, renovation market is increasing uh, very in an interesting way. Yeah, let me see if we can do a final question for you. Um, um, yeah, what and there is a question coming in for you, Renato. What kind of options are yeah. there for integrating solar PV in, uh, for example, the moment, monumental buildings or city centers? Uh, so, do you so the, are you seeing that in the city, for example, um, uh, uh, for a, for a church, is is it not up? Yeah, is there an obstruction from the from this kind of uh, application? No, we, okay, we here we are seeing uh, one of the possible BIPV solution that is based on glass. So uh -huh. we transform glass for architecture in a PV glass for architecture. But for example, it's possible uh, for a church, we are uh, designing a project in Switzerland where uh, we realize the roof of that uh, church uh, with uh, um, uh, gray uh, ceramic slate mm -hmm. with photovoltaic integrated. In this case, uh, the uh, type of uh, the BIPV solution is based non, non, uh, not uh, on glass, but on ceramic. And uh, the, the, the gray ceramic is integrated in that kind of, uh, of architecture. Then uh, you can use a, a colored solar cell, for example. And uh, colored solar cells uh, can be uh, brown, green, or also, also gray. So, uh, you can increase the level of integration using some uh, technology like uh, ceramic as a base element for BIPV or, or uh, colored cells. Or okay. in, in, in other cases, there are also some thin film solution that uh, could be very attractive for, for some special application. Okay. Well, um, thanks so much uh, for your uh, wonderful explanation and answers to the questions, uh, Renato, and, and, your, and your presentation. Hang in there, so after the, the final speaker, we'll, we'll have some more questions coming in. Um, in the meantime, let's do another poll question. Um, and um, um, so, if my colleague can show that on the screen, hang in there for a second. We will ask you, what do you see as the most attractive market segment? The question I, uh, I also asked uh, Renato. And uh, Chris before, do you think it's the BIPV facades, the glass structures, like the atrium's uh, car park shading systems, maybe the integrated roof solutions like the Holy Church uh, application, or maybe uh, PV glass, see-through glass uh, solutions. So make your votes and um, let's see if all of you think that um, maybe the churches could be one of the most interesting segments the integrated roof solutions, a segment where also Tesla is aiming to have a, an impact, or the very financially attractive car park shading systems, which were discussed by Renato as well. All right. Um, let me see. So I think most people gave their votes, and so we can show the results on screen. So facades. At least for uh, for our audience, the BIPV facade seems to be the most attractive. No, not so much. I'm, well, I'm I'm surprised that the glass structure atriums uh, were considered only for by six percent of you. And um, yeah, the the integrated roof solutions are also considered very attractive. All right, thank you. So um, let's now go to the um, final uh, speaker, Anthony. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Anthony, welcome, uh, all the way from California. Um, take it away with your presentation, and uh, let me know if you can uh, control the slides. I can do it for you, but you're supposed to be able to take care of that. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, thanks for the opportunity to join this interesting BIPV discussion. Um, I'm actually in New York City. Ah, uh, it wouldn't be bad to be. I think it's raining too much in California, so it's all right. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so I'm Anthony Pereira, president and founder of Alt Power. We're uh, a PV integrator. Uh, we specialize in BIPV uh, over the years. Um, there's some stuff about me on the next slide, but in in uh, in brief, um, I had joined the PV industry. Um, actually not able to change the slide, guys. 
I will I will control the slides for you, Anthony. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so uh, I start. So I, I was in the PV industry back in the early to mid '90s and um, worked initially in, in uh, with an architect out in uh, here in New York City, uh, Greg Kish, um, Kish and Capcar Architects. And I was introduced to BIPV then uh, with that firm. I was in construction and architecture in 1998. Took saw some business opportunities and started a PV company, Alt Power. Um, and we've done uh, again a lot. We do a lot of rooftop stuff, but we're involved with BIPV, and it sort of uh, was uh, an organic evolution. And part of it's being in such a vertical city like Manhattan, these opportunities exist. Um, so next slide there, Edwin. And so what is BIPV? I'm showing you this slide. You know, we again we do full full installation services. So I was asked to install this system for the Department of Energy. Uh, Sun Power. If you could go back one slide, sorry. Uh, Department of Energy's um, headquarters in Washington D.C. The Sun Power uh, Sun Power Corporation purchased Power Light. They had a roof integrated module flat but had a styrofoam uh, base and as you can see in this photograph to the left of the array you can see it has a, like a concrete uh, roof surface that's actually what the styrofoam is as a concrete layer above and then they had a PV module we actually went up onto the roof and cut that old roof out with a, a regular, uh, concrete saw and then we just placed this right in we integrated it so is it BIPV yeah it's BIPV okay uh, there's another system down in uh, the tip of Manhattan where they'll never be shade. It's right up to the water. Museum of Jewish Heritage by uh, a major architect um, and does a lot of museums. And these are the kind of guys that like PV. But they had, so the Battery Park City Authority is developing the whole uh, southwestern part of Manhattan. And they have this museum, which is across from the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. It, and the museum has a lot of mechanical stuff on on it. They put a wall around all the mechanical stuff and they have this span of steel and they had a, st a perforated stainless steel screen going over it. I was asked to price out a PV system, just standard modules, and uh, we won. We were, we were cheaper than the other option just straight out. Okay, so no, no tax credits. It's a museum. It was just a better option. Next slide, please. But then we get into real integration, as I like to say. And when you really start to replace true elements of buildings, even though those other ones are arguments and debates, and I just showed. So we have the Solaire building, which was our, re, our first facade system. It's in lower Manhattan. Uh, it's the first major building constructed after the 9-11 uh, attacks. So it was a major event for New York. We were building, rebuilding lower Manhattan. We're two blocks from the World Trade Center site. And new construction in New York is going to be super green. So a lot of fanfare for this building. And the operator, the owners of the building do, do a great job of maintaining this building at peak operation. And uh, we have an integrated facade. We have um, an interesting situation on the roof. Uh, we're, we use a standard module that had to go through extra testing, and uh, that was because of a union thing where we were trying to share trades and unions and having everybody involved. So we had at that entrance canopy, which you see in the top right slide, glazers came in and did the glass work. The middle picture of the facade is ornamental iron workers. They're doing that installation. Of course, electricians are working on both of those. But then at the top, the electricians wanted more scope they were fighting for 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 claiming this kind of work it was new in new york city and you got to get your your teeth in it right away and uh the standard ul module was the way that they claim it if it's not ul listed you can get away with other trades doing the work if it's ul listed there's no way that local three or the ibew is going to not install your product so there's a, that's an interesting thing we'll come to later uh, but we had to go through multiple testing, uh, wind, wind tunnel tests to make sure that that standard module could withstand the PSF mechanical load at the top of the building, which is another reason why using BIPV is better than standard modules, although it did pass. It was a 75 watt module, a really small ratio of frame to glass. Uh, next building here is the sister building of the Solaire. The owners liked it. Um, we worked with the same architects, uh, a truly integrated facade, 
Um, mullion stick out a little bit too much. We put separate diodes on the, on the top row cells, so play a little fancy electric stuff there, but this is the bulkhead of the building. It's mechanical behind. It's not insulated. It's not a, a maintained uh, uh, space, so we were able to get away with like real easy wiring on the interior of the space which isn't the case or wasn't the case in the previous building where we had living space behind the facade. Next slide. Uh, then we get another mechanical space. Architect wants it to look black. We use a, a black sun power cell, uh, really efficient. And we're thinking about trades and how these costs are reduced. What do you do to make these installations go smoothly? on a 37 story building in lower Manhattan. So we have a crane putting these modules into place. We were able to laminate these modules in Germany. They were shipped over to the US. Uh, they were uh, glazed into a unitized system um, in Missouri, shipped back to the US, pre-wired. They could be lifted and put into place and connected in series because it was a string per, per unit. Uh, very quickly. So the installation really took a day. We, we started the first day. It was too windy for the crane to operate. Uh, but these things, even though we're cutting costs and stuff, you know, the crane is $12,000 a day. So you're paying that. And if it's windy, you're still paying it. And they stop you from working. So that's a unitized unit being lifted up right off the flatbed straight from Missouri, lower Manhattan. Next slide, please. A uh, system we did with Shuko when they had a lamination or BIPV uh, uh, unit in Germany. Uh, um, Polshek Partnership Architects, uh, they have a new name now, but uh, great architects out of New York. This is a sun power cell on a louver system that actually tracks the sun during the day, a little crazy and super expensive. Uh, multiple trades uh, claim this work. There were arbitration hearings in Washington, D.C. over the work's claims between glazer, or ornamental iron workers and electricians, and yet sheet metal workers claim to work because they were called louvers. Very interesting trade stuff happening. That's a big part of it as well as the financial side of it. Next slide, please. Here you got a little detail what those louvers look like. They're about seven and a half feet long, foot and a half wide. Next slide. Uh, down in North Carolina, a job we had uh, Urtex laminate for us. Um, and we're using spider connections on the corners. You know, this is standard glazing stuff. Glazers down North Carolina did. We uh, didn't have to have uh, union issues down there. And uh, it was done pretty easily and smoothly. Just a glass installation of these guys. Uh, bags, Bagatello Architectural Glass Systems out of Sacramento. We worked with them and we did this project for Guardian Glass. It's a rain screen. We use sun power cells, uh, also laminated by Urtex. Next job. Uh, next slide, please. There you go. Here we did this job with uh, with Renato. Uh, back next slide. Sorry, yeah, previously. This is PS sixty two. So so Lower Manhattan is booming. Uh, World Trade Center is getting redeveloped, and there's so many people moving to Lower Manhattan. Even though that thought that would never happen, that they realized they needed a school. So we uh, did a couple of canopies. There's a standard system on the roof, but this is a beautiful glass entryway that uh, Renato uh, or Energy Glass uh, laminated for us using sun power cells. Next slide. There's a job out at the uh, Seattle uh, Tacoma International Airport. Seattle likes blue and green. That's like their town colors. This is a clock tower as you enter the airport grounds so you know how late you are for your flight. And uh, it was done with an artist, so no architects involved. An artist wants to do this thing. It's a sculpture. It's got LEDs on one side. Anyway, next slide will show you some details. So we had these, you know, Renato spoke about colored, slide, uh, colored cells. So Seattle's like blue and green, so cells are mostly blue. We use a poly cell because they like the look of it. And we had it dyed green, so it looks like this. It's got a white back sheet of uh, of glass. Uh, it's PVB, and I haven't mentioned PVB. Renato has like all the stuff we're showing. It has PVB inner layers. Super critical for safety. It's a big issue, and a lot of stuff going on in this BAPV world is like totally unsafe and probably never meets the building codes. 
super issue that that I'm passionate about. But uh, anyway, these are safety glass units, colored cells, also uh, laminated by Vertex. Next slide, please. Lower Manhattan for uh, Pelly's office again. Same developer as the Solaire and the Verdesian. We're using the same cell, which is a cool cell that was being made down in Delaware by originally by Astro Power, then by GE, which was a 100% post-industrial recycle content cell that uh, came from Intel, and GE made it into a working solar cell. Uh, this is a condominium. Interesting thing about condominiums and developers, they never get to use the tax credit. So I just haven't seen the ITC used by anybody yet. I know it's mentioned as an incentive available, but don't see it happen. Next slide. So you see construction. Benson was a facade constructor. We've got ventilation on the uh, top and bottom of the module. It's also a mechanical uh, area, so there's no living quarters behind it. Um, easy access to wiring. Um, and we get ventilation back there to make the system perform a little cooler, which is nice, not always easy on facades. Next slide, please. So it looks like from the building across. Next slide, please. Yeah, so a little detail on what's going on there. It's an IGU unit. So insulated. It's uh, again got some good ventilation going on in there. Yeah, there's about three or four different sizes of modules there. Here's a job we did. We're not though out in Copenhagen. Industrian Seuss. Really nice uh, glass. Um, area where they have functions underneath so if you look at the next slide uh really nice interior space and the pv makes it so it's it's really cool it's a double insulated unit so it's got uh, three layers of glass again pvb for safety because it's overhead where people are uh, congregating you have screen print two low e coatings and of course a bipv top layer Next slide, please. A little closer look. Next slide, please. All right, so this is the fun part. All right, just going to start making some noise here. Uh, we looked at this in lower Manhattan, uh, a facade retrofit. Basically, they were gutting an entire building about 30 stories high in lower Manhattan. Okay, we worked with top groups in New York City, top architects, top engineers that build buildings not only in New York, but globally. And also the general contractor was Tishman, who built the, the World Trade Center and several other skyscrapers all over New York. So when we were getting pricing for this, we were getting real pricing. This is the real stuff to get something really built in New York and what it could look like. So you have 14,280 square feet of uh, facade. That's about 1,300 square meters. And you have zero watts if it's just glass. You have 224 kW if it's BIPV. We're using a sun power cell, and it's an IGEU unit, right? So it's an insulated glass unit. It's truly integrated in the facade. It's spandrel. It's covering floor plates and covering uh, columns. So, you know, what do we get? Well, you know, the costs are just crazy. So if you look at the cost of regular glass system installed, $2.125 million dollars. The BIPV one is $4.5 million, okay? So just to give you what that means and the jargon that we are used in, that's $20.10 per watt DC, and that's $315 a square foot, and that's uh, $3,393 per square meter. Um, so, you know, that's everything, though. This is a turnkey, full installation, multiple trades, tall building, New York City, union construction, engineering, architecture, developer fees, everything. Everything all in, all approvals. That's what we get. So then we, if we can get the investment tax credit, again, never saw it happen. Developers amazingly never pay taxes, it seems. But they also usually get tax credits to build mo most of the time. And uh, also, if they're developers and like building a condo or whatever, they never really own the building. They just build it and then it gets flipped over to a condo association. So capturing that tax credit is a little bit difficult. Uh, State NYSERDA has a, a pretty bad grant for BIPV and you get penalized for 
for vertical systems really. So it's it used to have a higher watt uh, per watt AC incentive. They got rid of many years ago, but uh, incentives are totally needed. Um, uh, we need to get people incentivized to come up with creative ideas to expand the market and make things cheaper. It's clear and uh, it's being ignored by the PV industry and it's being ignored by politicians. Um, local NYC real estate tax abatement. It used to exist, doesn't really exist too much anymore. It's going away. We never really use it. It's a little complicated paperwork wise, but you know, it was available then. So $226,000. Okay. So again, the, the total cost of BIPV systems, four and a half million, you get 1.3 million from the Fed investment tax credit, assuming you could use it, $200,000 from NYSERDA, 226,000 from this real, tax, uh, real estate tax abatement. And then you get depreciation, right, which is accel accelerated for PV systems in the United States, so five five-year makers. Uh, that's $1.3 million worth of that. If you, you know, you gotta own your building and, and you've gotta own it for a long time, which really doesn't happen much, but still, if you can capture it, you do, and you make energy uh, using PV cyst, and again, Sun Power sells um, nine hundred seventy-five thousand dollars worth of energy over twenty years, and then you look at the net costs, and you've paid a less than a half a million for the system versus what you could get, you know, for a full system. So, just an interesting way of looking at it, and all of that stuff is very difficult to capture, but all very possible to capture, which means is that early conversations, not only with architects, but the developer and the money guys themselves, super important. This is going on too long. Next slide is the last slide. And I'm just going to show you what I see at the airport in Copenhagen when I'm there. And it's like, this goes on. There's building after building of this type of facade. It's a screen print, but it is our aesthetic. It is our standard monocrystalline or polycrystalline aesthetic. They are doing what we do. They want that look. It's all over the place. And that will never pay back for itself. So even if we put a system with no incentive and I see average paybacks of 15 years, obviously if you can do what I showed you in that slide in New York City and get a system that's cheaper per square foot before you even install it, it's a win-win situation. But in this case, just generating energy for like an authority that runs an airport, and they have long-term views on development and everything. It really just doesn't make sense to replicate the aesthetic, pay the little extra cost. I know it's so much cheaper, but that should be PV. Thanks, folks. That's it. Thank you, Anthony. Well, wonderful last uh, sheet. Uh, great presentation uh, and a good business case. Um, questions are coming in. Very interesting. I, what, what comes up in my mind, and I know that this uh, Europe is diff different from the US. Um, you mentioned some several times that some of these projects where uh, you have to deal with the unions and others not. Can, can you say, can you elaborate a little bit more on, on what kind of markets you have to deal with unions and which projects you don't? Well, I mean, it varies throughout the United States. There's a lot of different jurisdictions, right? But if you're working on a major project, pretty much anywhere, you're going to deal with the trades. And um, there's really good advantages to working with them. So, you know, they're well-trained. They have a lot of experience. Maybe not with BIPV, but no one really does. Um, but uh, you know, if you're building a skyscraper in New York or Chicago or LA, you're going to have the uh, organized trades involved. There's really no way around it. Maybe in some southern states, you have less of an influence there, but major projects are always going to go with organized trade. Yeah. So what, from your experience, and obviously you have a lot of experience in the BIPV and dealt with the several um, yeah offtakers, whether developers or building owners, etc. So um, what do you, you consider as the major obstacle for a larger scale BRPV application? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, Evan? Yeah, so, so what do you see as the major obstacle for a larger scale BIPV application, um, having dealt with, uh, you know, all these various yeah. uh, off-takers, either developers, uh, building owners, etc. cetera. Uh, what do you huh. see as the major obstacle? Yeah, you know, I, I really think that the, uh, the 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 standard PV industry is the biggest problem that we have in BIPV because they're they're polluting the minds of the folks that want to do BIPV because it's so different of a thing. We're not building electrical electric power plants. They're competing against the price of coal generated energy, right? Yeah, that's what the PV industry does. That's what I when I build a ground mount. That's what I'm doing. That's my focus. 
we are a uh, you know a building material you know like one thing i get to, just just have to say is you know bipv elements already are, are and have been cheaper than other building options other building material options you know if somebody wants to build some really elaborate stainless steel you know facade on the top of the chrysler building you know that's not cheap either and yeah. uh marble and other kinds of glass it's uh it's it's we already compete with that stuff and that's where the market and, and major architecture and where we're not those sees i'm sure growth and where he's even been in model projects and where i see growth is his major firms it's it's museums it's major skyscrapers major developments in major cities uh for facades and like true building integrated stuff you know and then there's these other things going on with rooftops i never knew why anybody wanted to replicate an asphalt shingle uh because i never thought that was an aesthetically pleasing building material from the start so i see the rd going into that as being like you know missed opportunities to do something cool with pv but instead you know we're gonna try to be an asphalt signal for some reason um but uh you know there's th that, that that market and you know what's happening with car canopies even though a lot of that stuff doesn't meet the building code i would say the majority does it around the united states um so these are great opportunities and there's really good economies of scale there but when you see these major you know glass buildings and stuff you're talking about you're competing with high-end stuff already and that market's going to be what it is. And right now, there's a lot of opportunity. There's global growth in urban centers, and people are invested in museums and stadiums and all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah. So, so what, to your opinion, should be done to, uh, yeah, to accelerate the market? Is it a transfer of knowledge to uh, to architects or to uh, the building industry? Well, in that sense, it's like the PV industry, it, 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 the standard PV industry itself. There's numerous fronts that have to be tackled. There are political and incentive ones, right? They need to have some kind of incentive. I mean, it doesn't have to happen. It's, you know, but if you want to see rapid growth in zero energy buildings and carbon reduction like they have proposed, you know, you have to do it. So just start doing it, you know. Uh, people don't even know about it, so it's a big education barrier. And I mean, politically, they don't know about it. Architects and engineers, everybody in construction has to learn about it. Uh, standards or standards are a huge obstacle and there you know the, the lack of a true safe standard is a problem I texted during it that you know in Europe I did stuff in Copenhagen that you would never be allowed to do in New York or Chicago and uh, I think the codes of the United States are very good they're very strict but we're going for safety and longevity here but they're being ignored generally and a lot of stuff is being installed that I see that that could be potential problems. A lot of my experience has to do with working with the building department in the city of New York and coming wow. up with standards and stuff. So, okay. Well, there are some. Uh, we have a couple of more interesting questions coming in. Um, so, how do you, is the number received? Like the fifteen-year payback time is that number well received uh, within uh, your uh, customer group, like by with developers or with the building owners? Like everybody likes the con everybody likes the concept that they can install something that will pay for itself. The problem is they never really own anything for yeah. very long, you know. So, so who's gonna, you know? So you got to get a rental, you know. The rental construction market is good, and and folks are gonna build and own and hold a property. That's a great opportunity. But what museums and municipal buildings and stadiums? Nobody gets tax credits or any of that stuff, you know. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, you know, incentives have to be just different. Yeah, very practical question. Uh, um, uh, do you have in the U.S. anything with uh, the legally arranged with the right to solar access? Uh, you know, for instance, if you have, can you protect your solar PV facade uh, for good insula insulation? If uh, and that, that somebody does erect a, a building next to your uh, building, which will shade your PV system. Yeah, well, look, I mean, it depends. There are already some states and jurisdictions that have solar access laws. New York does, but these are really for residential uh, systems where people might plant trees that eventually shade your system, stuff like that. They haven't been challenged or taken to the level you're talking about, which would be interesting. But, you know, I think as a New Yorker and what you see in New York is like, you know, those kind of limits on we, we wouldn't have the city we have if we put a lot of limits on what you could do. So, you know, it's a risk in New York, it, it, but other jurisdictions, sure. But I wouldn't want to see something like that in New York because it just holds back, you know, the progress of the city.
Yeah. Um, another uh, interesting question. Uh, we see a lot of applications with crystalline silicon cells. So what's your opinion on the see-through amorphous silicon? Well, I don't really see much uh, opportunity for vision glass. Um, not seeing that you know jurisdiction that truly would understand would allow vision glass. Uh, so don't know what you would you know the, the, you you're what I see when I laminate thin film with PVB and safety glass is actually cost more than a mono or poly cell anyway. And uh, there's actually more limitations to it than there are with poly and mono cells from what I've seen design wise. So, uh, I mean, so I don't know, I'm a, you know, I just, I don't, I've never seen anything that really got me excited, but I know people are working on it and I hope things come about that, but I think a lot of, you know, understanding what, what they're up against and um, what I've seen jurisdictions vote on, you know, or, or not approve some, some handrail systems and vision blast, uh, I think it's tough. Yeah. Well, we, you're obviously in touch, uh, I guess, with with architects for new buildings, um, and, and many. And this is one question coming in that many architects uh, have an objection to black and blue appearance of BRPV in building facades. What's your experience uh, with uh, transparent PV uh, units? You know, I mean, I, I hear about it, and I have no experience. With it. <laughs> you okay. know, what, what what we do is, uh, you know, we've we've done mono or poly cells spaced out between two sheets of glass. You know, to get some kind of like you saw on the Copenhagen shots. Uh, but you know, can I make a see-through piece of glass that's making energy, do it affordably, make it worthwhile? Is it, you know, what's that window? Is it operable? And then how do I deal with wiring? And how are you dealing with wiring inside the millions anyway? And all that stuff is just like so unknown and so untested in the United States that, man, you know, what we're doing right now is tough enough. I think there's some serious challenges to that if you really understand the issues. Yeah. So from your perspective, I also asked the other speakers, what do you consider as the most interesting market segment if you look at your business? Um, which type of application for a BIPV? I would say it's like high-end building materials, facades and, and uh, canopies, really. But on the higher end for the construction markets, that's what but I might try to focus on anyway. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, I think we covered most of our, well, there's another question, maybe very technical, but you, you might be able to answer that. Is, uh, have you done any BIPV projects with thermal energy recovery, like BIPVT? No. I mean, the only thing was that facade for the Visionaire where they had some ventilation they originally talked about capturing the you know the heated air coming off the back of the modules but it was just too expensive to really do it for what they were getting um but you know there could be some interesting stuff like that uh, um as a final question and i i, I go back to your uh, previous slide on the the economics uh, I, a question of what is included in a net cost uh, you showed uh, on this slide everything everything Everything. It's me meeting the architect for the first time. It's the architect, the engineer, the developer's time, the expediter's time to get approval, the electrician, the glazer, the ornamental iron worker, the guys making the mullion systems, um, you know, the guys putting it in, commissioning it, getting the approvals, being there for inspections, all of that stuff. Everything. Okay. Great. Um, thanks, Anthony, for all your uh, answers on, to these detailed questions. Thanks for a great presentation. Uh, I, I love the slide as an example of how we we shouldn't uh, treat the market, uh, we, how we should, and what kind of opportunities there are not only in Europe but maybe also in the U.S. Um, thank you so much for a great presentation. I I'm not seeing any further questions coming in for the other speakers, are they? I'm looking at my colleague here and I don't see any more questions and since we are running out of time and I see people leaving the room, um, I will like to, would like to thank all speakers, uh, all participants, all attendees for this um, interesting webinar. Keep uh, keep posted, keep us uh, keep following us. We might follow up with, on this webinar with additional events um, in the on architectural solar. Um, thanks to our speakers, thanks uh, to everyone and my colleagues at Solar Plaza and I hope to see you or hear you uh, next time on some other event. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks.